Hello, everyone, and welcome to the seventh Agda problem solving session. And today we have something exciting as well, because we are going to move on to cubicle Agda, in which a lot of things become easier and a lot of things become more interesting as well. Um, so to start off with, we have these postulates like univalence and function extensionality. Um, well, they were postulates before. We're not going to get to univalence today, but we are going to show at the very beginning why something like function extensionality is very easy. And I should mention that I didn't, um, I had an endocrinology appointment uh, yesterday, so I didn't watch the lecture. Uh, so I'm going into this uh, somewhat blind. Um, so apologies if I repeat stuff that happened in lecture. Anyway, are there any questions related to the lecture, which I didn't watch, which I can try and answer? Yes. I guess. Uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, maybe a nice question, but uh, uh, um, uh, almost for clarification, uh, I'm not sure if I understood that uh, uh, identity type definition by path induction is not allowed in, in cubical order, or it's not just the, the more adequate uh, uh, approach uh, for more? more so uh, more what happens is that there's no such thing as it's not an the identity type is not an inductive data type defined with Ruffle as a constructor. Um, what that means is that you can't pattern match on a path with three endpoints and reduce to reflexivity. However, there is a propositional path induction, and that's called J. So if you look in the active pre prelude, um, where is J? J should be somewhere here. Or was it in lecture? I'm a bit surprised by this. There should be. Um, I don't think we Jay. talked about it in lecture. I yesterday. Yeah, I don't think we got the J in lecture. I see. So it's probably going to happen next time. Um, but you can prove um, path induction, uh, oh. which generally means that it's a bit more annoying to use because you like have to state the motive explicitly every single time. Um, but the other aspect of it is that um, path induction. Do you remember how many lemmas we proved just by path induction? The thing about cubical mm -hmm. agda is that you do not need to prove all of those lemmas because there is uh -huh. a lot less need to do it. So almost everything that you would write a separate lemma and just prove it by path induction uh, mm -hmm. follows just from the fact that you have an um, interval type. Uh, okay. So something like function extensionality, for example, uh, follows from that. And that wasn't even something that you could prove by path induction, but something like app, dependent app as well. Okay, nice. Thank you. Thank you a lot. It uh, helps. Uh, were there any other questions? Yes, I, I did not understood uh, what was HCOM. Ah, uh, so <laughs> that's a very long discussion. I'm not sure okay. how much the lecturer intends to discuss it, um, but I can draw some pictures at the end of today to give you a bit of motivation on how HCOM works. Okay, okay, perfect. <clears throat> How much was H comp discussed in lecture? Zero. Yes, it was left as a magic, uh, magic thing. It's just magic, something like that. Yeah, you, that's kind of a problem because it shows up in some of the homework, actually. Right. Um, actually, it does because I tried to do some of the exercises at the end here. And uh, these exercises are actually very doable if you have everything that's in the cubicle Agda library. But we don't have everything that's in the cubicle Agda library. All that we have is this short prelude. And a bunch of results that you need to actually do this are proven by using HCOMP in the library. Uh, for example, uh, that app distributes over path concatenation is something that's necessary um, for this exercise. Um, but that's not available here. Oh, great. But I will, yeah. at the end of today, uh, show you how path concatenation is defined using H comps and how you can write it out. I think that's a good thing to cover. Okay, guys. Okay, should I start or is there anything else? Okay, so let's do a uh, fun X depth. And this is really going to be an exercise um, or fun XD uh, in just stating what function extensionality is. 
So suppose that we have two functions and notice by the way that we've used variables. It's um, in this assignment, whenever I have A and B, they will refer to a type and a type family. And uh, why can I use these variables L? Well, it turns out that in cubicle prelude, there's uh, some non-privates about pu public variable declarations. So whenever you use these symbols um, in a function signature, if they're not explicitly bound, then they'll become implicit arguments at the start. Um, similarly, these are also other variable declarations. But if we have uh, two functions, f and g, and they're dependent functions, so for all x and a, I get something of type b of x. And what I have is a proof that for all x in a, that's, and I should put parentheses around this as well. So f of x and g of x live in different, well, actually f of x and g of x both live in b of x. So we can just compare them, right? So if we have a proof of this, then it should be the case that f equals g. Now, um, I'm going to do my best to explain how I think about this. Um, so we have the point one of intuition is that what is an equality? An equality you should think of in your head as literally being a path in the sense that there is an interval and you've parameterized movement from one point to the other, right? Um, so what we have is f and g, and then we have some proof p, which is a homotopy uh, between the functions. And the question is, what do we do? So we want to show that f equals g. Now, if we want to show that there's an equality, what we can do is that we can implicitly bound another interval variable. So I'm going to say what this path is from f to g by saying what it is at the point i in the interval. Um, so for example, uh, typically, this doesn't reduce. Here, I press C, U, C, U, C, 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 comma, and it's still an equality type. So it doesn't look like it's a function type, right? And equality types and function types differ a bit. But when you want to prove an equality, you are actually able to abstract over an interval variable. So that's the first key point. And notice now that I have an interval variable. And my boundary is a bit messy. Why are there these question mark zeros? Well, I want to show, uh, I want to produce a function, dependent function, uh, from A to B. And the boundary of these functions should be F and G. Um, but functions are a bit annoying. So what I can do is I can abstract over the argument to x as well. And now I want to just, it gets cleaned up. Basically, you'll have these uh, metas in the boundary uh, when uh, it's a function type. Um, so in order to make it be nice and clean, what you have to do is you have to abstract over all of the arguments and just make it some non-telescope, um, non-pi type. Then all I want to do is I want to construct a path between f of x and g of x. Well, how do I do that? I have my proof p. And what p is, is that for every point x, it's a proof that f of x equals g of x. And um, now I don't want to give a path. I want to give a term of b of x. So I'm going to evaluate this at the interval variable i. And um, we can also sort of make these two things implicit because they'd be evident from the path type. And then the statement becomes very quick. Um, all that we've done really is we've taken the variables i and x and we've rearranged them. And this makes sense if you think about what you're trying to prove. What does it mean to produce an equality between these two things? It means to produce a path. Now, how do I produce a path between functions? Well, I'm going to tell you um, what it is at every value of the function. That's already built in into how this cubicle identity type works. Any questions? So to give another example that's in basically the same spirit as this, good, cool, it makes sense. Let's suppose that we have um, a function, so f from um, x to y, or rather from a, x and a, uh, to b of x. And suppose that we have two points, x and y in A, and suppose that we have a path P from x to 
y. Then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to construct a path from f of x to g of x. But the problem is that f of x and g of x, f of x lives in b of x, g of x lives in b of y. So these live in different fibers. However, there is a path connecting these fibers. Um, if you consider the path fiber b of p of i, then when i is i naught, so let's say I just put a hole here and I consider b of p of i. Right now, um, this won't make sense because i doesn't make sense. However, the interval has two endpoints. Let's say I say p of i naught. Well, if p is a path from x to y, then p of i naught is definitionally what? B of X. Yeah, so P of I naught would just be X and then we get B of X. And in order to test this out, what I can do is I can press C, 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 N. I can normalize this expression. And you see at the bottom here that it says B of X, right? And similarly, if I evaluate P of I one and I normalize this, then I get B of Y. Um, so this is basically if I consider the path lambda I. And if I want to create um, a path, I can abstract over I. I, I can write lambda i to b of p of i. Um, and then I can consider basically a path that's dependent on stuff. And then if you sort of look at what path p is, if I deduce the type of path p, the argument that it takes is uh, the first explicit argument is a function from i to types, so from i to the universe. And so I'm going to give that function from i to the universe. At every point in the interval, I'm going to consider the fiber B of P of I. And then a, I need to provide what the endpoints of this dependent path should be. And one lives in the fiber at I naught, the other lives in the fiber at I one. Um, and so those two things could be respectively, well, I can refine. And what's in B of X? Well, F of X is in B of X. And what's in B of Y? Well, f a g, rather um, rather f of y, is in b of y. And the proof of this usually in non-cubical lambda, you do a path induction here, right? You reduce p to reflexivity because it has pre endpoints, and then you just give the reflexivity path. Well, here we don't have to do that. So this is our first example where we avoid what would be a path induction proof entirely by just the nature of what cubical operations are. Um, so if I start with this and I just do these two arguments, what I'm required to do is this dependent path. Really in AGDA, um, the path type is just a desugaring for the dependent path type with constant fibers. The dependent path type is the more general form of path that you have. And so, um, the same thing applies where I can abstract over an interval variable. And then I want to produce a path in B of P of I from F of X to F of Y. Well, what is P? P is a path from X to Y. So what if I evaluate F at the point P of I? Because P of I connects X to Y. So if I evaluate it at every single point in the path, then I get a path in the image over the fibers um, B of P of I from um, F of X to F of Y. So if I like to deduce what the type of this is, it'll say that it's in B of P of I, right? Because um, I'm evaluating it at P of I and B takes an argument X to the um, fiber B of X. So it, this would be in B of P of I. And that's what I want. And if I sort of look at what I naught is and I normalize it, it's F of X. And if I look at why one is, and I normalize it, it's f of y. So that just works. No path induction necessary. Any questions? Yes. It is hard that this uh, seems to be uh, more practical. So I sometimes, um, very rarely, cubicle doesn't perform the way that I want, and I have to rewrite a project in non-cubicle aga. It's happened before. And what happens when I have to rewrite a project from cubicle aga to non-cubicle aga is that I have some proof. And then that proof 
turns into a proof with like five or six different lemmas, all of which just follow directly by path induction, mm -hmm. which I did not have to do path induction for in Cubicle Agda. Mm -hmm. Cubicle is my default programming language. State and prove that inhabited uh, propositions are contractible. Uh, sure, uh, let's do that. So, um, let's call it inhab prop. So suppose that A is some type here, and suppose that we know um, is prop A. And suppose that we also know we have an inhabitant of A. Then it should follow is contour A. So if we look at what the definitions are, is prop means that any two points can be uniformly identified. Um, so for any two points, there's, there's an identification between them. Uh, what does is contour say? It says that there is a center of contraction and that for every other point, we could identify it with the center of contraction. Um, so if we look at this, we want to show is contour A. And what is contour A amounts to showing is we have to give a center of contraction, right? And we have to, for every other point, uniformly identify it with the center of contraction. So what should our center of contraction be? Well, we've got a point X and A, and we've got REFL from X to X. So that seems like yep. the only that seems like the only candidate we have. Exactly. Um, so X should be the center of contraction. And then um, good. So we want a sigma type. So if we were fine, we'd get a pair. And what I want in the second component is an, for every point Y, an identification from X to Y, right? So here I can abstract over Y. I like to put parens here. And then we want to prove that X equals Y. Well, what does is prop give us? So if I do P and then I do any two points can be uniformly identified, right? This would be so much harder to prove in non-cubical agda. I, I don't know how if you're appreciating this, um, but wow, uh, just so much better. And the next two exercises go to show this as well. Um, so suppose that we have a function and we know that every single one of its fibers is a proposition. There's a question if I don't need to use lambda. Um, well, in this position, for this component, I want to produce, um, oh, that's a good point. If I do P of X, uh, I've just Ada expanded it. Thanks, Alice. That's a good point, an excellent point. Right. Um, so here, uh, let's say we have um, some, I'd like to call this P instead. So we've shown that um, in this sort of uh, type family, uh, all of the fibers are propositions. And then I want to show that the space of sections of this vibration, or in other words, the dependent function space is also a proposition. Um, so I want to show that something's a proposition. So if I sort of expand what this means, it means for every two functions, what should I call my functions? I should call them F and G, right? Um, so now I want to prove that f equals g. How do I prove that two things are equal? Well, I abstract over an interpol variable. Um, well, so the fact that we're using this definition of is prop does make this easier. Uh, so for example, if um, is prop, I created a path from y to x instead of x to y, then, uh, but what you're saving is just doing an abstraction. And this is the definition, this definition of is prop is standard. It's basically the same definition that we, it is in fact, exactly the same definition that we were using before. Okay, so now I want to, I have these annoying metas here. Why are there metas? Because the goal isn't fully abstracted. So now I'm also going to over abstract over a point in the function space in the domain, 
rather. And now I want to produce an equality of f of x and g of x in the fiber b of x. Well, P tells me that every fiber is contractible, and I care about the fiber at X being contractible. And then I can identify any points in it, such as F of X and G of X. So that gives me an identification of F of X and G of X, but that's not what I want. I want to point in B of X with this specified boundary. So I also apply this, I evaluate this at this interval variable. Um, now, there's sort of the inverse of function x. This isn't an interesting exercise. It's basically very similar to this. Um, the reason that that exercise is there is because it's suggested that we use it in this exercise, but we don't actually need to use it to prove that exercise. We can do it directly by hand. I personally, in using cubicle agda, never um, call function extensionality. I, you can always inline function extensionality. And in fact, I think it's easier to inline function extensionality because when you inline function extensionality, you abstract over the path arguments on the left of an equal sign. Whereas if you use function extensionality, then you'd write fun x and then you'd abstract over the arguments. And that's a bit more annoying. Okay. Um, so I, I again like to call these P's. What we want to show is is set so for every two functions and every two equalities between the functions let's call those equalities alpha and beta so now we want to show that alpha equals beta well i'm going to abstract over an interval variable and now i want to show that f equals g but this is another equality so i can abstract over a second interval variable now i want to show there are a bunch of metas here, and those metas aren't nice. Um, so, but I can abstract over x again. And now um, there are two interval variables. Um, so I need to fill in something that amounts to a square. And this is the boundary of that square. And um, it might be a bit confusing to think about right now, but it's actually not that bad. Uh, but notice that the entire thing is in just it's in B of x, so it's in a cons, it's in a type. Uh, it's not dependent on the interval variables. Well, if I think about it, then what do I have? I have P, which for every X gives me a proof that B of X is a set. Now, um, what that means is that for any two points and any two identifications between them, well, let's say my points are F of X and G of X as before. Now I need to give for any two identifications between them, I want to identify them. Well, sort of alpha is an identification between F and G. But what's an identification from F of X to G of X? Well, what I can do is I can consider sort of abstracting over the interval variable K because I need to give a path from F of X to G of X. And then I can consider alpha at the path variable k at x. So let's think about what this means. What this means is that alpha is a path from f to g, and I'm basically applying x onto it. So now I get a path from f of x to g of x corresponding to alpha. Um, and I can do the same thing for beta. And these are things. So what I get is a proof that um, the paths over an interval variable, alpha i x is, um, as a path is equivalent to the path beta i x. Now, um, if I look at this, um, I could basically sort of evaluate this at boundary variables. So let's say I evaluate it at i dots. Then I just get the path, this path. Let's say I evaluate it at i. Well, then I get p of x, but let's say I evaluate that further at i naught. Then I just get f of x. So what I do is I just put i and j here, and it works. So this is something that does fill the desired boundary of the square. And you can see, again, that this would be much harder to prove in non-cubical agda. Okay, now we're going to move on to a really fun exercise. Um, so 
singletons were defined in a certain way in lecture. And you mentioned uh, before that um, one of the things that might have made this easier um, is the definition of is prop that we use. So this version of singleton, it's a bit more annoying. And the reason that it's a bit more annoying is that if we sort of looked at the definition of singleton in lecture seven, it gave us a path um, from the center uh, to x, right? Whereas what's happening here is that I have a path from x to the center. So I basically reverse this. And what that amounts to doing is it makes the next proof a bit more technically complex. And I should write out. Um, so I will definitely need to pull out uh, notes and start writing in order to make this clear. Uh, so for a point A, we consider the single type as singleton type at x. What is the singleton type anyway? Um, in topological terms, the singleton type is known as the path space. So it's the space of all paths originating from that point and going to any other point. That's how you think about it. Why is that space contractible? Because if you have a bunch of paths, you can sort of truncate them to time i in the interval as, and then shrink i, and that gives a uniform way to pull all of the paths back to there. And because you give this logical uniform description, it's continuous. Um, so what we want to show is that this is contractible, right? And um, what it means to show that it's contractible is to give a center of contraction, right? So if we consider the path space at a point, all paths originating from that point, then what should the center of contraction be? It's a path from the point to somewhere else. What path is it? What's the simplest path from a point to somewhere else? Raffle. Yeah. Um, so the, and then uh, because we want a point of the singleton, we first need to give the what the end point is. So the end point is going to be x, and the path is going to be REPL. And the great thing about cubicle is, well, this isn't a great thing about cubicle. Uh, the version of um, the identity type that we're using, so REFL is something that we defined. We don't need to put REFL x. It's just REFL um, with the definitions that we're using. So here's the center of contraction. And then I need to produce something. Uh, I disagree that REFL x is better. It's uh, sometimes x is very big. Sometimes x is huge and you just do not want to write it. So what we need to show is that for any other point um, in this type, let's call it alpha, because it's not a point like x. It's a point and a path. And then I want to show that there's an identification from the center of contraction to this point. And I'm going to put parens here because I like parens around my lambdas. When x is huge, I make a where clause for it. I mean, that's valid. It's valid. Um, I, I don't want that extra where clause floating around in my code. But yeah, sure. OK, so uh, here's the deal. Um, alpha, uh, I actually want, I can refer to basically the first projection, the second projection of alpha, but I don't want to do that. I'm instead going to use a pattern match lambda uh, so that I can actually uh, split on alpha as being a point y and a path p. So if you attended one of my previous tutorials, then you will have heard um, about pattern match lambdas. Um, now what I want to do is I want to produce a path. Well, in this lambda, I can just continue abstracting over things. So I can also add an abstraction over an interval variable. Now what I'm required to do is I'm required to produce a path in the type singleton x, which is a type of pairs, uh, from x refl to yp. So let's just remember that as being our goal. I want to see if I'm able to do this uh, without having to resort to going to paper uh, in order to finish it. So that's our goal. Um, and if we sort of want to normalize what that goal is, we can also write it as this, right? Let's call it Z. Um, and so, if we want to produce a path in a pair, we can give sort of a pair of paths, um, and we can just do it explicitly. So in the x coordinates, what we want is a path from x to y, and that's um, 
Well, P is reversed, right? So it's a path from Y to X. So if we want a path from X to Y, uh, we have to take P and we have to reverse it. Um, so you can invert a path by uh, evaluating it at um, the neg I. Um, I is the reversal. It takes, um, so computationally, if you do something like I naught, well, that's an interval variable. If you do neg of I naught, you see that that normalizes to I1 and neg of I1 normalizes to I naught. So that's the computational behavior of this uh, neg operation. Okay, um, so we want a path that has two components. So here I'll do P of tilde I. And then what happens is generally Agda is not very good at goals. So here it's going to get confused. And if I look at what this is, I'll no longer have this boundary stuff. Instead, I'll have these constraints. And when boundary data gets moved to constraints, you're a bit sad always. But um, what I want to do is the goal is going to be a, so there are some boundary constraints on this because I've also abstracted over I. Um, so whatever I have here, it has to have certain endpoints at um, I naught and when I is I naught and when I is I one, if it uses, makes reference to I. But I also want to produce a path from P of tilde I to X. Um, so if I want to produce a path, uh, let's just remember this. The goal is this. So you know what? I think I'm just going to do it and then I'm going to explain it in a second. So because we want to produce a path, I can abstract over another interval variable. And now the data is just not going to be useful at all. It's just going to say that I want something from A with a bunch of constraints. Well, let's now think about this very carefully. Um, I can take the path P. This is from Y to X. I can evaluate this path at uh, tilde I. Sure, that's a thing. But then what I want to do is I want uh, a path from P tilde I to X. Now, where is X? X is the endpoint of the path P, right? So if you sort of think of the path P as happening from here, then, uh, okay. Sorry, let me just pull this up for a second. Uh, so it's very often to helpful to draw pictures when you're working in cubicle identity. So what we have basically is a path P. Let's say this is the interval variable and this is the path P. Um, it's defined as a function on the interval. Then at the interval, uh, you have some variable, let's say um, I, it's somewhere. And then uh, what happens is that there's the reversal of I, right? So it's sort of the mirror image of the point I. And what we want is a path uh, P of tilde I to X, which is the endpoint here. So basically what we want to do is we want to reparameterize this section into being its own path. How do we do that? That's the question, right? So what I want to do is I want to ensure that no matter what argument I evaluate P at, that argument is at least as big as tilde I, right? Because I, I want to throw away all of these values. That's the, that's the game. So how do I throw away all of those values? Well, I can take P and then I can evaluate it on something and I'm going to take tilde I and then that I'm going to take the maximum of stuff and then I'm going to put something here. So what that means is that no matter what I put for question mark, um, what it's going to output is the point on the interval that's at least as far along as tilde I, right? Because this is the max operation.
And then if I want a path from uh, tilde i to x, well, I've sort of abstracted over the interval variable j, so I put j here. So uh, p of tilde i, and then I type in a v to give the max operation, and then I put j. And so if I look at this, for example, um, it, it's accepted. So the picture for it was exactly this. We wanted a path uh, between these two things. Uh, we wanted a path from p of tilde i to x. p is a path from y to x. Uh, we want to basically take that path and we want to cut out all of this. So what we do is when evaluating it at j, we put in a max tilde i. Sorry, this is not a max operation. It's the opposite of a max operation. It is a, no, it's it's the max operation. Yeah, it is the max operation. Um, so if j is less than tilde i, then you're going to evaluate it at tilde i. So you can think of this path in terms of j as it's constant at p of tilde i until j exceeds tilde i. And by the way, in cubicle type theory, there is no greater than operation. Oh, well, I guess there is, because you can say I um, wedge J is equal to J. Uh, but uh, it's sort of path types of interval variables behave differently as well, uh, because the interval is not a type. It's a special kind of thing. OK, so that was the fun exercise. Um, and so what we used in this fun exercise was a bunch of these um, primitive operations on the interval that make it into a, what is it, a Boolean algebra? It's not a Boolean, uh, some sort of algebra. There's a name for this kind of, a De Morgan algebra, De Morgan algebra, that's the name. So that was a really fun exercise, I think. Any questions about that? Oh, okay. So then we have an easy exercise. And after we do this easy exercise, I won't go into the hit stuff. Instead, I'll talk about HCOM for a bit. Um, oh no, oh no. I had beautiful stuff and I deleted all of the beautiful stuff. Um yeah, if you just consider I naught and I1, then it's a Boolean algebra, but sort of there are intermediate values. So that's the difference between a De Morgan and Boolean algebra. Um, in particular, I think that in the De Morgan algebra, the following formula holds. I um, I is I uh, naught um, or um, tilde I is I naught. So actually the fall, no, 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 I can state it like this. The maximum of I and tilde I is definitionally I one. So the following thing is not true um, for the interval variable, because if you have two points on the interval, a point in its reflection, then the maximum of them isn't necessarily one of I naught or I one. But in a Boolean algebra, if you take any two things in the Boolean algebra and you take the max of it and its uh, negation, uh, then yeah, one of, it has to be the top maximum elements, right? So that's the difference between a De Morgan and a Boolean algebra. OK, uh, I don't like the way that these sigma types are written, so I'll just rewrite it a bit differently. Um, yep. And then this fits on one line. Um, and then we want the reverse of this. And this is actually, you're going to see it's a great, uh, it's an easy exercise. OK, let's start off with this. Um, so suppose that uh, we have two elements, x and y, living in a sigma type. 
And suppose that we have a path uh, from their first components between their first components and a dependent path between their second components, where it's over the path in the first components. Um, so what we are going to start off with is some pair of equalities, alpha and beta. And you can see that we want a path from x to y. Alpha is a path um, PR, uh, x, PR1x to PR1y, and this is a path PR2x to PR2y. Um, so the thing is that if I put alpha i, well, the sigma types are defined as records, and records have definitional eta. So we have, for example, um, suppose, oh, there's a bit of background from you. Uh, so here is just like a lemma. Uh, suppose that we have x and we want to show that it's equivalent to uh, PR1x comma PR2x. Uh, so if this were um, defined as an inductive type, not as a record, uh, then we'd have to do induction and break x into two components to do this. But it turns out that you can just type in REPL and it works because um, records have definitional eta laws. Um, so that suggests that we don't actually have to pattern match on x as two components. And instead, we can just do alpha i. That's a path from PR1x to PR2y. And then we can put in something here. Oh, right. I want a path. So I'm going to abstract over an integral variable. Um, and if I look at what I have to do here, I need to do a path in from PR2x to PR2y over B of alpha i. But I do have a path over them. Um, that's exactly beta. Beta is over B of alpha i. So it lives, if I do beta of i, you can see that it lives in the appropriate place. Now, suppose that I have a path uh, between these two pairs, and I want to construct a pair of paths. Well, I'll refine that. Now, what I can do is I can apply um, PR1 onto alpha, right? These prims are superfluous. And here, what can I do? What did I define at the beginning? Apt. Um, yeah. So this is a dependent function. If I sort of deduce what the type of PR2 is, you can see that it's a dependent function. Um, but I can apt this onto alpha. And what I get is a path over alpha one. Uh, this, these two things are uh, definitionally equal if I sort of you can see that they match. So bam, voila. Cool. Now, um, P here, what type does P have? Let's see. Because we didn't write the type explicitly. And we didn't write the type explicitly because it's big. Um, but it's a pair. It's a pair of equalities. So we can split that as alpha, beta, if we so choose. And look at what we're supposed to do. Uh, we're supposed to prove this. But if we look at what that sort of the composition of these two functions is, it's the path alpha i and beta i, right? But here there's alpha and here there's beta. So this is just an eta expansion of alpha, right? So if I just type in ruffle, does that work? It does. Here, what is p? p is a path from x to y. Let's call it alpha. Um, so what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to produce uh, an equality between PR1 of alpha and I and PR2 of alpha and I. But if I consider the pair, it, this is sort of an eta expansion. Um, this is uh, alpha, this is equivalence to alpha is the same as lambda I alpha I, right? And if I consider alpha I, then by definitional eta records, that's the same as PR1 alpha I, PR2 alpha I. So this should also just be REPL.
Okay, now let me teach you a bit about HCOMPs. So the way that HCOMPs work is that um, suppose that you have some sort of context and the context has some interval variables in it. Let's just say we have one interval variable in it, right? Um, so uh, our context basically looks like it's something that's parameterized by an interval variable. Now, what I can do is I can imagine cases in which that interval variable is I naught, in which this interval variable is I one, right? Um, so that's where sort of these in S types come in. Um, you can sort of consider a type like A uh, such that, and then you can put something here and uh, you can put, for example, um, I uh, or tilde I. Uh, so let me demonstrate that in ACTA. If we sort of look at cubicle prelude, uh, we have this operation, right? Um, so let's consider um, sort of, I guess, um, suppose that we have um, some path from I to type. And uh, let's call this A. And suppose that we sort of have um, elements X in um, A of I naught and Y in A of I one. So I'm going to produce a type. Um, I actually, uh, cubicle has changed a bit. So for a technical reason, I don't think it's going to be a type. I think it's going to be a simplicial set. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider this A type and then I'm going to restrict it to something. Now I'm going to consider the expression I or tilde I. Uh, so what this refers to is the boundary of the square. Hmm, one second. Um, yeah, this is a bit uh, annoying. Okay, GLI. Okay, fine. This should work. Oh, uh, A of I. Right. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to consider the type basically A of I, and then I'm going to put a restriction on it. Um, and the restriction is going to be of the following form. So this is going to look weird. So here I'm going to abstract over, um, and then let me just remind myself how I write this because I haven't written it in a while. Um, so let's say I do I um, I'm just going to cheat for a second and just look at how I write this.
Oh, of course. Okay, and then it's complaining because I haven't given a full split. So then I do um, the other case. So if I look at what type I'm supposed to define here, it's supposed to be is one I or I naught to A sub I. And um, in order to sort of give cases when uh, this expression is one, I need to give the case when I is I naught and I is I one. And this will be acceptable. And then when I is I naught, I want to consider the type um, a point in A and I naught, and I'll say X, and here I'll give Y. So basically, uh, what I've now produced is, suppose that I have um, some path, right, from um, the interval to types. I have some path parameterized by the interval, types parameterized by the interval. And I've given two endpoints, um, one in A and I naught and one in A and I one. Then what I'm going to produce is a type of paths from basically I to A of I, except for the fact that when I is equal to I naught, this has to be definitionally X. And when I is I one, this has to be definitionally Y. So basically what I've done is I've turned this type maps from an interval into types into something that's akin to the cubical equality type, which is paths from the interval that are definitionally specific things on boundary points, right? So what? this is, go ahead. What is that syntax? Is, is I equals I zero another type? Uh, so oh, what this is, a is that or, it's, or what? it's a, it's part of the face lattice. Um, so it's a lattice, um, it defines certain expressions. So here I'll give you some examples. Um, let's say that you have a context in which you have several variables, right? Um, so it, it, in a context where you have like I naught, um, what you can have is, um, you can sort of specify, well, I want something at the boundary. Um, so may, let's say you have two interval variables, i and j, right? Then you can consider something like, um, let's say this is the increase in these directions. Uh, you can say something like, um, let's consider the equation phi is equal to i1, right? Mm -hmm. um, then let's consider some expression for phi, such as... Um, I um let's say min of I and J or uh something like I. Uh so let's say something like neg I. Then the question is, let's actually draw this in blue. Uh, what am I defining here? Um, I'm defining a certain collection of faces. So when is I um, and J, the max, uh, the min of I and J equal to one? When both I and J are one? Yeah. So this point corresponds to the equation I or J is equal to one. And when is this expression equal to one? When I is zero. Yes. So this defines this face. The opposite face, or not opposite, but the upper face yeah, instead. The, the J, the J. Oh, line. sorry. When I, uh, yeah, thank you. When I is zero, right. Um, now, you could write tilde i equals zero, but the way that we actually write this is that this corresponds to i is equal to i naught, right? So now I'm going to specify a condition on each of these faces. So I'm going to define a function only, I'm going to define a function, but only on these faces, right? Only on these faces. And so how I define a function only on those faces is that I do a pattern match lambda and then I consider the case i is equal to i naught, and then I give some value. And then I consider the case i is equal to uh, rather 
let's say i wedge j is equal to i1. And then I give some value. And that's and, why you made uh, the... What... Sorry, continue. Uh, so uh, what that does is that it defines a function, but only on a specific range. And this is going to be very relevant for how we do HPOMP. Because suppose that I have a single interval variable in my context, right? Then suppose that I want to define basically um, some. So this is the interval variable in my context. Um, I'm going to specify a path on the endpoints. Um, I'm on this endpoint going to specify some equality from this to another point, right? Um, so I I'm going to basically, in the context where I have an interval variable, pass to the face lattice corresponding to these endpoints and provide the data of a path on these points to some other points, right? Let's say all of this lives in the type A. Then what HCOMP does is that it returns in the context of that interval variable, a point in A. And the meaning of that is that it is the filler of this. So this path would be HCOMP with the appropriate boundary data that defines it. Now, how do we define composition? How we define path concatenation is that if we have paths P and Q, we put the path P here. We put the path Q here, oriented like this and like this. Then here we put REFL. And when we H comp it, the resulting filler is known as P dot Q. So let me show you when, how that works. Go ahead. When you say filler, uh... sorry, not filler. Uh, the uh, it's, filler would be different. I do not mean filler. I've been making a mistake. Well, uh, sort of the lid. You would say lid. The lid is p dot q of this q. So like something something that completes the like a commutative diagram, basically. Yeah. Um, there is in fact a way to fill this and get points as prep functions of i and j, right? So here at the moment, we sort of only have an interval variable i in our context. It's also possible to add a variable j and get the filler. Um, what we're producing is the lid. How much of the... So, so in, in your phi equational example, you seem to have defined a, a function on a simplicial set as its domain, just those, just that one zero cell and that one one cell. Um, so this will actually are... define an element in A, uh, in the type A, not with A restricted to stuff. It'll literally define an element in the type A. How much of the boundary do you need to have defined before HCOMP will say, cool, None. I can take care of the rest? None. You can HCOMP with no fillers at all. Um, and the problem is that it won't reduce at all. Uh, so the cool thing about this path, path expression p dot q is that if you evaluate it at i naught, it's definitionally the left endpoint, and at i one, it's definitionally the right endpoint of q, right? But you don't actually have to give this path data because you chose to give these paths, right? You could h comp with no boundary at all. That you that's allowed. So uh, let's do our Babby's first h comp example. <laughs> And let's define um, pop concatenation prime. So we have the type A defined. Suppose we have points X, Y, and Z in A. And we have paths um, P from X to Y and Q from Y to Z. Uh, then we're going to define a path from X to Z, that's the goal, right? Can you choose the bottom lid? Um, well, the way that HCOMP works is that it gives you a lid. You can sort of, if you do the filler, H fill, 
uh, then you can evaluate it at j equals zero, and then you get the bottom, which is the path. Anyway, uh, let's do our Babby's first H comp. Um, so I want to do H comp, and I want to see what the type is. So first, I need to give. Um, basically, there's an implicit uh, parameter here. Um, I'm going to put this interval variable in the context because that's important. Now, if I look at what the type of H comp is, I sort of have this var phi, and I'm going to set that to be the expression I or tilde I. Then I'm going to give the super important argument, which is what is this stuff on the boundary? So um, at the boundary point, I is equal to I naught. I'm going to have some stuff. And at the boundary point, I is equal to I one. I'm going to have some stuff. Oh, 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 I see, I see, I see. Um, or do I see? Or do I, in fact, see? Okay, sorry, let me just quickly cheat for a second. Um, or do I need to cheat? I want to produce a path. Oh, 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 H comp. Let's just look at the type of H comp again. Sorry. Um, so I need a path from I to is one I. So I'm going to first abstract over the interval variable J. That's the catch because it needs to be a path. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do GL J two, and then I'm going to do this pattern match lambda. Um, and I think that I can just write it as maybe I can just start abstracting here. Is this allowed? Is this legal syntax? Uh, this is not legal syntax. Um, this should be legal syntax, right. So, um, OK, I need to provide paths for H comp. They have to be in the context of another J. Uh, because for H comp, you need actually this interval variable J. So we introduce J and then we do this case split on sort of this in phi, which I, bar phi, which I put here. And at the left end point, it should just be the constant path at X, right? And at the right end point, well, we introduce the variable J. So it should be the path Q of J. And one second, uh, Spotify um, just started playing music. Uh, where is Spotify? Spotify is here. Okay, I can pause it. It is Crystal Castles. That is the band that is playing. Um, oh, because X is not in scope. Um, OK, now I need to produce a uh, path that uh, I need to give the base of the cube. And that's going to be the path Q of I. And that's going to give me a point in A. Uh, you know what? When I do this, I'm actually going to put this dot prime, and then I'm going to give x. Oh, uh, yeah, because it's p. That's the problem. OK, there we go. There, that was not a very elegant uh, attempt, but that was our Babby's first H comp. Um, so I, I will explain this again um, after I make the coloring be OK. Oh, I've been going on a bit longer, but uh, I'll wrap it up soon. Um, so 
uh, this argument is unnecessary um, because it can sort of be inferred from the split that I do here. Um, the, this thing means that I'm really defining it over that base lattice where uh, phi is like, the expression I or I naught. And then I've specified a path here, I've specified a path here, I've specified the base, and that gives me in the context of I a point in A. Right? So that's how it works. That's our Babby's first H problem. Okay, well, I've gone a bit over time. Um, are there any questions? I guess I should stop the recording first.